بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين وصحابته ومتبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد They put me البرزخ بين البحرين here both sweet not مالح like the inner space between the two oceans so uh, I want to talk a little bit inshallah about the topic was youth and the family and I want to talk a little about the nature of youth and the nature of family if we look at the world and we look at uh, the nature of ourselves as sentient beings in this world then the thing that is important to perceive is that we're in time creatures in fact it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called the surah or the uh, chapter form in the Quran at insan the other word for it is also a dahar is time man and time they have those two meanings so we are in time creatures by our nature and yet we are moving into an out of time realm and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this most precious gift which is the gift of time of life itself and life is time life is time by its nature and we have what are called the Mawasim al umar which are seasons of, uh, of our lives and the ulama actually have categorized these seasons and most of them have placed them into seven types of seasons now the nature of time in the American society is the famous equation that everybody learns very early on whether they're born here or whether they come here as immigrants time is money this is what we're told time is money and Conversely, money is time because the equation is supposed to work both sides. And in a sense, there's a truth to that, only unfortunately, most people uh, don't understand the nature of money or what is of real value. What is of real value in the Islamic uh, sense is gold and silver. That is why traditionally they were called al-ayn or money itself because they were intrinsically of worth, of benefit and value. In the American society, money is actually valueless. It's paper that really has no value, and so they mistake a means, which is this paper, for a, 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 an end, which is true wealth. Now, in the Islamic perspective, what Islam did really is it completely shattered all of these, uh, these uh, dunya or worldly understandings of wealth by its nature. And so, when the Prophet ﷺ came and was given this revelation, what he did was transform a very materialistic society, in fact, the, the main reason that they were persecuting the Prophet ﷺ was out of economic fear. It's interesting to understand that. That the Meccans were afraid that he would undermine their religion, which was their source of economic uh, flourishment in Mecca. And so there's a strong connection between religion and economics. Now in the Islamic teaching, the economics of Islam is to teach us true investment. And according to the Quran, true investment is akhirah. If time is money, then your life is your capital. And the nature of capital is that you should invest it in order for it to accrue. The nature of time is that it's dissipating. We cannot gain back the moments of our life that took place five minutes ago. They're gone forever. And so really, if you put things in perspective, you soon recognize that you cannot invest in this world. That the only investment that you can truly make that will have returns is in the other world. If you're going to invest time, if you're going to invest time as a capital, which it is, rasmaluka, it is your capital, time. By the nature of time, man is in loss. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except those who believe in Allah and do right actions. Khusr, it's interesting, this word is the same word for economic loss. Khasara in the Arabic language. So man is in loss because his time, walasri, his time is dissipating and he's not investing in the akhirah. And the only people that are making sound investments are alladina amanu wa amilu sarihat. Watawasaw bil haq, watawasaw bil sabr. These are the people of true economic investment and they are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sayyadzi al muhsini that he rewards the people of ihsan. And so, time, shabab, this is the most precious time of our lives, what is called youth. In the Arabic language, shabbat al nar means the nar reached, its, it began to, to, uh, to uh, flourish up, to, to become uh, inflamed. In and like shabab, youth, it's like a fire because wood, the nature of the human being, you see, is like coming out of the earth. This is a, uh, like a tree. That is our nature. And so this 
burning time of the youth is a time that if you invest it and you utilize it, when you have that fire, that energy, that zeal, and this is why the Prophet Sallallahu again turned all the traditional understandings of the Quraysh and of the Arab with their whole, they almost worship uh, old age. The Prophet Sallallahu put Uzama, Usama bin Zaid at the head of an army when he was 17 years old. And this was upsetting uh, the paradigm of those people. It was upsetting their whole way of perception that he was too young to lead an army. And yet the Prophet Sallallahu knew that if a society is to be strong, if it is to be creative and dynamic, then it needs the energy of the youth and they must have positions of leadership and the guidance of the older and the wise. It needs these two. The youth have the arm, they have the power, they have the muscle to make change. And the, the, the aged have the wisdom to guide that change in order that it doesn't go off course. And so there's a, a beautiful balance in Islam between age and youth. If you look at this, لَيْسَ minna. He is not from us. Those who do not show our aged respect, in other words, learn from them and take them. That is true waqar. And those who do not have mercy on our youth, that don't show them compassion, that don't recognize that they need to be affirmed, they need to be confirmed in the beautiful ayahs of Quran and all of the Quran is beautiful when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the tongue of Ibrahim وَقَالَ إِنِّي ذَاهِبُنْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّ سَيَهْدِينَ I'm going to my Lord and He will guide me and then He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala رَبِّ هَبْلِي رَبِّ هَبْلِي مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Give me from the righteous not give me from the wealthy not give me from the intellectuals not give me somebody of dunya or worldly rank give me from the صَالِحِينَ and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ We gave him glad tidings of a forbearing son. We gave him glad tidings. Children are bushra from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're bushra. It is mata'u al-hayat al-dunya. It's the pleasure of this world. Al-mal wal banun. This is uh, the ornaments of the world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given his creatures and yet remind them that they have to have an internal sacrifice. That they must recognize that this is Allah's mulk and not the possession of the parents. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَلَمَّا When he reached his full strength, this youth at the age, and, and those days, this meant 12 years old at puberty, when they reached that age, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Ibrahim said, قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ And this بُنَيَّ is a beautiful expression of affection, telling his, uh, his son, إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ I see in my sleep that I'm going to sacrifice you. I'm going to sacrifice you. He saw in, in, his, in his heart, in this internal capacity of the human being, which is the last remnant of prophecy that exists for humankind, is the true dream. He saw in this dream, and the dreams of the prophets are prophecy, that he was going to sacrifice his son. And then he says this beautiful, Thandor. He asked his son, Thandor, Mada tara? What, how do you see? And I'm asking you, tell me your opinion. Tell me what you understand of this. And this is not بالاختيار. The Mufassirun say this is not choice, but it is mushawara in recognizing that he must share this with his son, although he knows he must implement the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does his son say? قَالَ يَا أَبَتِي فَعَنْ تُؤْمَرُ O my father, do as you've been commanded. Subhanallah. It, this is uh, unprecedented in, in human dialogue. The 12-year-old son, his father telling him he's going to sacrifice him, that he sees he should sacrifice What What should I do? Tell me, give me some advice from you. And he says, do as you're told. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as You will find me from the patient ones. This is the beautiful balance between parents and their children. There must be a respect that comes from the parents to the children. They must recognize that their children are identities unto themselves. That they have understanding. There's a beautiful story of Zubair, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, when Umar ibn al-Khattab, and we all know Umar's Heba, his the awesomeness that he inspired in people. He walked by a group of children playing, and when they saw Umar, they all fled. Nafaru. Waram Yadra Ahad illa ibn Zubair. None of them remained except Ibn Zubair. So somebody saw this and he said to Ibn Zubair, Why don't you flee from Umar like all the other children? And he's a young boy playing. And he says, the road is not so narrow that I have to expand it for him. And I don't have any wrong action that I should fear him. This is a child speaking. 
And this is the understanding and the wisdom that children that are raised in an, in an Islamic milieu and an Islamic environment will have. And you will see this manifest in children. When I had the good fortune of living in uh, West Africa in a very traditional uh, cultural environment, uh, of very learned people in the middle of the desert. They were Bedouin people living in tents, but they had very high Islamic education and understanding. And the children there at the age of 9, 10, 11 years old, you don't find the equivalence of those children in their, in their waqar and in their maturity that you find in 40-year-olds in this society, and that is not an exaggeration. That is not an exaggeration. And this is the Islamic society, and this is the nature of the people that we produced, and that Islam produced. Unfortunately, we're still working on this. Like the poet of Andalusia said, These are the remnants that we have left behind. So look after we're gone at our remnants. If we look at the, what the Muslims left behind, we see this extraordinary legacy. We have to understand the secrets of those. The secret of that legacy is that children must be, they must inculcate an Islamic worldview at an early age. The first training of the Muslim children was in the Book of Allah, in memorization. And this dip disciplines the mind in order to absorb massive amounts of information, which is the nature of learning. And then at the same time, taking it from people who embody the teaching, and so they learn also a spiritual teaching that goes along with the external information. And this is the nature of youth. Youth is a time of planting seeds. And those seeds will be reaped in the later age, like the Mauritanian poet who said, that people before the age of 40, because most of the ulama cut off the age of youth, even though we still have, the Arab love to call, they have great beards, Ya'ba Shabab, how you doing, you know, oh youth, and he's like wearing his abaya uh, with his hookah or something at the age of 65 or something. So the Muslims understood that youth ends at the age of 40. It ends at the age of 40. So we have this time which is Hasidah. Many in our uh, cultural environment, in, especially with many people coming from backgrounds, diverse backgrounds, we tend to forget the importance of education. We uh, have adopted Western models of education, which have some benefit, but there's also many deleterious aspects of these models. It's important to remember that the, 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 the dominant feature of the Western educational system is that it is an indoctrination into the logic of a system that is essentially alien to Islam. It is a process of indoctrination. They, at best, they want you to think through a framework that is alien to Islam by nature. It is not based on uh, principles. You see, it's based on overturning principles, in fact, because if you understand anything about postmodernism and the destructuralist and this uh, modern methodological uh, means, this is all based on completely questioning basic assumptions of any discipline. And the Muslim disciplines, there are certain principles that cannot be questioned. And the foundation of all Islamic knowledge is Tawheed is Tawheed, is correct understanding. These must be implanted in the youth. Now, in terms of moving in this society towards something dynamic, something happening, we, and this has been reiterated again and again, uh, Dr. Uh, Sakhar mentioned it, we have to get out of the doctor-engineer mode of thinking. There is a whole world out there. There are universes of discourse. There is much more than many of us imagine in intellectual disciplines. The Muslims were people by their nature they took in all knowledges. The Prophet ﷺ said, the, the nature of wisdom, it is, it is the lost riding beast of the mu'min. Wherever he finds it, he has more right to it. And this is a, 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 a signal from our Prophet ﷺ that we should seek knowledge in the hadith that uh, some people, uh, there's some weakness in it, but Ibn Abd al-Barr Hafid al-Maghrib mentions it in his book, Kitab al-Jami' al-Ilm al-Hikam. He mentions the hadith, Uttub al-Ilm wa al-Fasseen. And the principle is sound anyway, that we should seek knowledge even to China, that there are things to learn. And so we have to expand, we have to enter into disciplines in this culture. We have to enter into the academic world to begin to give people different alternative uh, structures, alternative ways of viewing reality itself. And this is now acceptable within their present methodological framework. So we have to understand that. We have vast opportunities here. We have incredible opportunities in this country. And the reality of it is we are here. We are a presence and we must begin to recognize that we are a presence in this country. We are a strong presence. 
We have to recognize that. And if we affect change here, change can be affected uh, across the world because we are in, you see, the dominant culture, this world culture. We are in it now. We are in the house of the, the spider, Beit al Kaboots. We are in it. And let us not be flies. Let us not be flies, but let us give people a different uh, approach or a way out. And this is what Islam does. I, am, I believe that the likening of the Muslims now in the Western Hemisphere is similar to the presence of the Christians in the Roman Empire. When they went to Rome, to the very heart of darkness in that period of time, they went into Rome, and within a very short period, the whole Roman structure was turned upside down, and Christianity became the religion of the state. This is what happened because of Christians that were willing to sacrifice for their deen. These people who, people watch them being eaten by lions. I mean, this is reality, this is historical fact. People watch these people giving up their lives for what they believe. Then they saw this sacrifice, and the religion changed. The danger of this situation is that the dominant culture can co-opt a religion and turn it into something else, which is what happened to Christianity. This is the unfortunate situation. We must guard ourselves of compromising our deen. As families, this is the unit that will allow the preservation of Islam in this country. Any uh, religious group that has immigrated to this country and maintained any presence, it is because of a strong, basic family environment. And this is true of the Jewish people, it's true of all of the other religions that have survived for any length of time. We have already lost people. We will continue to lose people. Unfortunately, this is the reality, not simply of America, but of the entire world situation that we are in. You are at, as much at risk of losing your child in Peshawar, or in Cairo, or in Baghdad, or in any of the uh, Muslim capitals of the world, uh, as you are anywhere else. I mean, this is the reality of the age we are living in. And so we have to, at some point, completely trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the mother of Musa, who, who had to throw her child into the river. Into the river. And this life by its nature is a river. The secret of Musa alayhi salam from amongst his secrets is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him in the house of Fir'aun. Those immigrants who have immigrated here, your children are being raised in the house of Fir'aun. They are the children that will be able to perceive the illusion that Fir'aun has created. The illusion that Fir'aun has created. And unfortunately this illusion is, is still affecting the Muslim masses in so many of our impoverished countries. So our children that are growing up in this country will have a different perspective. They will not fear the Fir'aun as Musa did not fear the Fir'aun because he saw him when he ate. He saw him when he had to go to the toilet. He saw him in his humanity. He saw him with his weaknesses. He was a short man. He was a short man. My Shaykh used to say, How can somebody claim divinity when his uh, deficiency is so clear? That's not a, some people would take that as politically incorrect. I'm not making any statements about short people. <laughs> that was one of my, uh, when I went to Hajj, because Americans are so big, and I was raised in a vegetarian family, so I didn't get those hormones that make me so big. But when I went to Hajj, I kind of for the first time felt like I was towering over people. It was interesting, because all these Muslims, still eating traditional food, so they're at normal heights. <laughs> and there I was, 5'9", looking like a giant amongst all these Indonesians and Malaysians. <laughs> and unfortunately, that can be a cause of arrogance. <laughs> that if you tower over people like the Americans tower over people with their football players and these things, they can start becoming deluded, thinking that they tower over them intellectually, which is a very dangerous assumption. I've been given my note and I've extended and Dr. Ahmed Al-Qadi, out of his generosity, said I could take a few more minutes because I tend to be long-winded. But uh, in the end of the day, I, in the final analysis, to quote John F. Kennedy, <laughs> we're all mortal and we're going to die. And we have to recognize that our children are not only uh, worldly beings, but they are otherworldly beings. And we have to invest in our children, you see. And the investment has to be an akhirah investment. The best thing that you can leave behind in this world is waradun salihun yad'u laka. Is a, uh, a sound child, a, a, a righteous child that does dua for you in the akhirah. And then the last thing I'll say is that people must remember 
Our children have rights. In fact, the ulama said that Allah has reminded parents of rights before He reminded children of their rights to their parents when He said, لا تقتلوا أولادكم خشة إملاق Don't kill your children out of fear of provision. This is the first right that a child has, the right to life. And we have been the cause whereby these children have been brought into existence. And we have to recognize that. We should neither kill them spiritually, nor should we kill them physically. But we should remember there is a spiritual death. And we should not be like the beggars of the subcontinent who maim their children in order to guarantee a good livelihood as a beggar. We can, by forcing our children to go into disciplines that are not, uh, they are not inclined to by nature, we can break their spirit and we can maim them internally in order to, in our own minds, to preserve or to protect for them their livelihood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for them in the wombs of their mothers.